So welcome to this site initiation video presentation for Starfish, which is a randomized controlled trial of the steroid routes of administration for idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, so I'm James Tyson and this is Matthew Smith and we are the chief investigators of this trial. So firstly, thank you very much for agreeing to open your site as part of this trial. It's a really exciting trial, which we hope will give us the answer to how we should be using steroids in patients with sudden hearing loss. Now it is a big trial. We need to recruit 525 study participants over three years from around 75 centres. So of course that brings with it its challenges. One of the biggest challenges is also that this is managing an emergency condition. And so a lot of the uh, presentations are out of ours. And so we're really pleased to be working with Integrate uh, and having trainees as associate uh, PIs who are going to play a very large part in this study. We've also made it really simple for people who are trying to recruit patients. We have e-consent and we have very streamlined forms to fill out. Uh, and we've also made it attractive to patients and we've included home hearing screening tests uh, and some online videos which can help you explain the trial to them and, and perhaps answer some of their questions. So after you've watched this video it's really important that you book yourself in for one of the live question and answer sessions so we can ensure that we answer all your queries. I will start taking you through the slides of the site initiation presentation for Starfish. Now, as we've said, this is a randomized control trial and it's looking at the steroid administration routes to treat study participants with idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. This is funded by the NIHR, the National Institute for Health and Care Research and with myself, James Tyson and Matthew Smith, we're running this as co-chief investigators. The University of Birmingham is a sponsor and therefore the clinical trials unit at Birmingham uh, will be helping run this trial managed by Karen James. Idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss is fairly rare. And that's one of the challenges of this trial that we'd like to pick up as many patients as possible with this, uh, with this issue. As we know, a lot of them do get better, but only partially a lot of the time. And what we really want to do is try and ensure that anyone presenting to the GP gets referred into their local ENT unit. And also we'll, uh, be having, we'll, 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 we have an advert uh, which we're running on Facebook to try and attract patients uh, so they can get themselves referred by their GP. We know that sudden hearing loss has a really huge impact on, on patients, both functionally and psychologically. And it was actually nice that put forward this particular issue that what we really don't know at the moment is which route of steroid administration is best to treat sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, and, that, and they, uh, identify this as high priority for research. So the primary objective of this trial is simply to establish whether steroids given orally uh, or by an instrument panic injection, that's three injections into the middle ear, or a combination of these two routes together is the most effective in allowing recovery of hearing of hearing in sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Now, while we're looking at that, uh, the other main secondary objectives are to look at the health economic impact of these treatments and how it affects patients. Uh, and also we've got some uh, home hearing tests that we're gonna be able to offer to, to patients so that they'll be able to use those either um, online or on the computer or, or smartphone. Um, and so we'll be able to hopefully identify the trajectory of recovery in the different treatment arms. Now it is a fairly simple, straightforward and pragmatic trial, uh, which is designed to uh, 
to, to, to follow what to follow the treatment pattern that you would usually uh, follow in everyday clinical practice. So we have adults who are able to enter the trial, only adults with sudden, uh, sudden, sudden sensory neural hearing loss, and they need to have had that hearing loss within four weeks of randomization. There is a screening process that will be taken through, and then if they meet the criteria to enter the trial and uh, agree to, there's e-consent that they would complete, and then they're randomized. There are investigations uh, that are carried out at baseline. They would already have had a pure tone audiogram prior to the screening for the trial. That's necessary, and we'll talk through that later. Um, then at baseline, they will, as well as having their previous audiogram, they'll have further hearing tests for speech discrimination, and then um, a range of questionnaires which will cover both their hearing, tinnitus, balance, and looking at the health economics. Now they will be randomised to one of three arms, oral steroids, intratrepanic steroids, or a combination of the two. During the following 12 weeks, they will be invited, if they so wish, to uh, run some hearing tests at home. There will be two further appointments, which will be follow up at six and 12 weeks. Uh, but both these time points, the hearing tests will be repeated, as well as questionnaires to look at hearing balance, tinnitus, and the health economics, and any side effects of the treatments that they've had. And at 12 weeks, they would complete their participation in the trial. So in terms of eligibility, first the inclusion criteria. Uh, so we need an audiogram before they're able to enter the trial. And therefore, why do we need this? Because the definition, uh, which you're, I'm sure familiar with, of sudden sensory neural hearing loss is a 30 decibel loss at least occurring within a three day period over three pure tone frequencies that are next to each other, contiguous, uh, out of 0.5, 1, 2 and 4 kilohertz. So that needs to be confirmed on a pure tone audiogram. They have to be 18 years or older with the onset of hearing loss within four weeks of the randomization date. And English is their first language because of some of the issues with the hearing tests and questionnaires um, that, will, that will necessitate that. Now there are some exclusion criteria which relates to either the diagnosis or treatment with steroids. So if you do know the cause for the hearing loss, then the patient is excluded. In the same way, if the hearing, sudden hearing loss is in both ears, the patient is also excluded. And any issues relating to steroid use for example, if they've already been treated with steroids for that same uh, episode of sudden sensory neural hearing loss, or if they have any medical contraindications or issues with taking steroids as set out in the eligibility list. When you identify someone with ISS NHL who you think could be eligible for the trial, please complete a screening record for them on the online system. Please do this even for people that turn out not to be eligible or people that decline to take part. This is so we can track if any of the criteria are limiting recruitment and to gauge if the study is acceptable to patients. The screening record will run through their criteria, so will help you confirm that the patient is indeed eligible for the trial. Of course, eligibility needs to be confirmed by someone with documented delegation of this duty and medically qualified to make that assessment. The screening record does not include any identifiers, so you can complete this without having first received consent. And we've kept it as brief as possible so it's quick to complete in the clinic setting. Remember to document assessment of eligibility in the patient's medical records too, even for those that are not eligible or don't enter the trial. The record should include the name of the trial, who made the assessment and the date and time of the assessment. Once eligibility is confirmed via the screening record, you'll be prompted to provide the patient with information about the trial and to seek informed consent. We've got two forms of patient information for the study. There's a written information sheet and a patient video. 
The video is about five and a half minutes long and covers the trial interventions and what's involved in participating. We'd encourage you to show this to any potential participants as part of your approach, or you can give them the link to watch it on their own devices. The video is available on the trial website at the link shown or can be viewed on YouTube. Patients should have sufficient time to review the information and have the opportunity to ask questions and discuss taking part before joining the trial. To avoid delay with treatment, it's fine to approach the patient, obtain consent and commence the intervention all on the same day, provided that both you and the patient are happy with that. Once the patient's satisfied with the information provided and their questions have been resolved, you can proceed to seek informed consent. Consent will be documented electronically via the online system by the participant and the consenting clinician agreeing to a declaration and electronically signing the form. There are a few optional consent items. These relate to additional permissions to be contacted by the trial team or for additional data sharing and access, including access to central databases such as NHS Digital. The patient can also complete additional optional at-home hearing tests online. Once the consent form is electronically signed, the patient can opt to receive their copy via a provided email address or in hard copy. Remember to also make a record of the patient's consent and participation in the trial in their medical records. This should include the name of the trial, the version of the patient information sheet provided, date of the discussion, the date and the time that consent was received, and a copy of the signed consent form, which you can print from the online system. Once the patient has consented to participate in the trial, you can proceed to randomise, which is also done by the online system. If you're randomising on a different day to completing the screening record, you'll be asked to confirm the eligibility criteria again, just in case there have been any changes. You'll also be asked to provide some data to verify eligibility, such as the date of birth to confirm age or the hearing thresholds from the pure tone audiogram that confirmed the diagnosis. You'll also provide the participants demographic details and confirm the minimisation variables before then being able to randomise the participant and receive their treatment allocation. The randomisation will ensure balance between the treatment arms in hearing loss severity, time since onset of hearing loss, whether or not there has been any new vertigo with the onset of hearing loss and by the participating site. When you randomise, an automated email will be sent to the person randomising, the site PI and to the trial team at Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit. The email will confirm the participant's trial ID number that they'll be identified by um, through their trial participation, uh, their treatment allocation, and it will also include a checklist of actions to complete following the randomisation. So this would include a reminder to notify the participant's GP of their involvement in the trial using the standard letter template we'll give you, um, or to add their name and trial ID number to the confidential identification log, and a reminder of everything that you should document in the patient's medical records or file in the investigator site file. The Starfish trial contains three treatment arms, and trial participants will be randomised in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio to oral steroids, intratympanic steroid, or a combination of oral and intratympanic steroids. Oral steroids will consist of a seven day course of prednisolone at a dose of one milligram per kilogram per day. And that's being rounded to the nearest five milligrams to help with prescribing. And it's to be given to a maximum dose of 60 milligrams. This should be given via a standard outpatient prescription or an FP10 prescription. We have a patient information sheet that should be given to all patients having oral steroids. And this gives information about how to take the medication, uh, what are the potential risks, and also allows them to document their taking of the medication. Interesting panic uh, steroids should be given as three injections spaced seven days apart. Dexamethasone 3.3 milligrams per mil or 3.8 milligrams per mil can be given depending on what you have available locally. And we have standardized the clinical technique for this uh, to be uh, as per protocol. Uh, and there's an online video that explains how to do this. Local anesthetic, however, can be given however you do in your local practice normally. Now, if recovery occurs in the unlikely event before the second or third injection, to near the normal hearing level, 
then it is appropriate to discuss with the patient whether it's uh, the right thing to do to continue to a second or a third injection. And it's within the trial protocol that you can omit ejections through two or three if hearing has returned to normal. In all other circumstances, it's recommended that you give the full three injections to meet the trial protocol. And again, there's a patient information sheet for intrastympatic steroids, telling the patient a bit more about them, uh, what the risks are and what to do in the event of any problems. It's important to ensure that dexamethasone is available, including to clinicians treating patients out of hours. The timing of injection uh, is important and it should ideally occur on the same or the next working day after the patient's consented. We appreciate with out of hours presentations and weekends, the delay might occur to the following Monday or Tuesday. Treatment should always be initiated within four weeks of symptom onset, and that's a key eligibility criteria for the trial. In arm three, so that's combination treatment, oral and intratympanic steroids should commence within four days of each other. Adherence is very important, and it will be monitored throughout the trial. And it's key that clinicians uh, ensure that the intratympanic steroids are given according to protocol, and that they encourage patients to take the oral steroids again according to the protocol. And for combined treatments, don't forget to give both patient information sheets to participants. We're asking anyone performing either the intratympanic injections or the AB word speech testing to complete some study training before undertaking these duties for the trial. There are training videos available on the trial website and a trial e-training system. You can self-certify that you've completed this training via the e-training system and the system will produce a certificate that you can then use as evidence of training. As with any trial activity, the PI should document delegation of these duties via the delegation log. And by signing the delegation log, the PI is confirming that the person is competent to perform their trial duties. Just as in clinical practice, we recommend supervision for newly trained or junior colleagues and you can contact the trial office if you'd like to arrange any further training. Although this is a clinical trial of an investigational medicinal product, there are no special pharmacy arrangements required. All the treatments that we're using are standard care treatments that are being used under their existing licenses. You can use your standard pharmacy stock and your normal processes for prescribing and for drug handling and accountability. There's no trial specific labelling. Looking at the trial outcomes, these are based on clinical assessments and also patient reported outcomes. Clinical assessments include otoscopy. Now this is primarily to check that the ear is appropriate for audiometry, but also we want to look for any contraindications to steroid injection to start with, and then any complications of the interventions afterwards. Pure audiometry is the basis for our primary intervention and so that's uh, really important to get right uh, and there's some advice on that later in particular relating to blinding of audiologists. And the trial includes AV phoneme speech audiometry uh, both at baseline and at follow-ups and that's to look at functional outcomes of patients and see how they're performing uh, which is more reflective of day-to-day -day experience for them. And these outcomes are all recorded at baseline six weeks and 12 weeks. The patient reported outcomes are all grouped together into a patient booklet for ease of use. And these include uh, measures of uh, speech performance and functional performance of hearing using the speech and spatial qualities hearing scale, the SSQ. Measures of dizziness using the VRBQ and of tinnitus using the TFI. And we've also got two patient reported measures for the health economic evaluation looking at quality of life and capacity. Uh, the um, patient outcomes should be recorded at baseline six and 12 weeks. Uh, and although the patient should be completing these booklets themselves, it is important that the clinician seeing them has a quick flick through the booklet afterwards to check there are no unanswered questions. And these booklets should be returned to the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit once they're completed, and there'll be paid, uh, prepaid envelopes available for this. Now the trial schedule uh, is uh, laid out over the next few slides and this starts with the patient presenting, typically referred by their GP, 
possibly seen in hours in a clinic or possibly out of hours by an on-call team. And the first stage is screening the patient to check that they meet criteria. Uh, and there is a screening form that can be done online so all of this is documented. In most cases, the patient will be seen by someone who's on the delegation log to start with uh, and who can uh, proceed with all the different trial protocol um, uh, events. And that includes informed consent right at the start uh, to be taken by someone who's got GCP training. This may then uh, lead to a second visit if the uh, adequately skilled staff are not available at the time, for example, if it's out of hours at a weekend. But in most cases, screening and the baseline uh, events will all take place on the same day. After consent, the patient will be randomised and this will be done online. And then they will be uh, receiving their intervention, either oral, intratepanic or combined steroids. Prior to having an injection, uh, all patients will have otoscopy uh, and all patients will have a pure tonoidogram. And if they've had one uh, a day or two beforehand, that's fine. That can be carried forward and used in the trial at baseline as well. At baseline, we also need an AB phoneme speech test. Next, the patients will be given their participant booklet and they'll be asked to complete the various uh, patient reported outcome measures and health economic assessments. Uh, that are part of that. The uh, intratepanic injection will almost always occur at the day of the baseline assessment, uh, but if in the, in the event that someone is not adequately skilled uh, and available for this, it can be delayed for up to two days. The second injection uh, occurs a week after the first, uh, with a leeway of a couple of days either side. And this is for arms two and three, so the interim panic and the combined treatment arms. Before they have their injection, it's important that patients undergo otoscopy to pick up any uh, concerns that might uh, prevent injection, uh, and also to, prevent, uh, to look for any um, issues that might prevent accurate audiometry. The Puritan audiogram uh, should then be done uh, prior to injection. The third injection should occur around two weeks after the first. And again, otoscopy and pure tone audiometry should occur before this, uh, followed by the injection. At week six, we have our first uh, set of trial outcomes. Uh, and we'd like patients to be seen six weeks from the point of randomization, uh, plus minus seven days to allow for uh, cancellations of clinics and other issues. Now it's important at this stage that when they have their audiogram, the pure tone audiogram, the patients have a blinded assessor. And this means someone who's not uh, provided the otoscopy themselves in case they see a perforation or evidence of the injection. And also someone who's not seen the patient and tested them prior to their previous injections. Now we appreciate this isn't always going to be possible and particularly in smaller centers, but it is the um, ideal that we should be striving for and the way that most patients should be treated in this trial. Patients should also undergo AB uh, phoneme testing uh, and also complete their patient questionnaires at their six week visit. And then the final visit is at 12 weeks. And at this point, uh, again, the patients should all undergo uh, otoscopy uh, they should have blinded audiometry and AB phoneme testing and complete the patient participant questionnaires. And this concludes the patient's involvement in the trial. Uh, and we will feed back results to them uh, if they've consented for that at a later date. One of the more novel aspects of the uh, Starfish trial are the home hearing tests. And these are optional tests for participants who have access to the internet at home and they can complete this uh, these tests via a website on a smartphone, on a tablet or a computer. And the aim of these home hearing tests are to define the trajectory of hearing recovery and to see if this varies between the different trial arms. And it's something that's strongly supported by our patient group. Uh, and actually many of them, it turns out, have been doing these tests at home anyway. And these tests can be completed via the trial website and it's recommended it's done every week for 12 weeks. And we currently have a digits in noise test uh, that can be used straight away. And we're also developing a pure tone audiogram test to be used in the future. 
And consenting participants will be supplied with earphones and hopefully this will help to motivate some of them to do, to do the test. And these earphones will be posted by the clinical trials unit. The uh, participants will get a weekly text message and this will prompt them uh, to uh, go to the website, uh, remind them how to do the test and also include a participant ID which is unique just for this testing. And we'll be using in-hospital tests to try and uh, aid with the validation of these home results, but they're also based on pretty well established and validated tests that are in regular use. Now the Associate PI scheme is an important part of the Starfish trial, and this is for trainees who are participating, uh, typically going to be an ENT trainee, but it doesn't have to be, it could be an audiologist or someone else. And it's a formal uh, training scheme set up by the NIHR to provide in-work training uh, for those who perhaps don't want to take time out of uh, their clinical practice for research. And it's a chance to experience what it means to work on and deliver an NIHR portfolio trial. And in this case, it's a randomized controlled trial and it's a drug trial as well. So there's added complexity there. And it's a, a, a scheme that requires a six month involvement. Uh, and this can be at more than one site if the trainee has to rotate on uh, due to their uh, clinical rotations. The local PI acts as a mentor to the associate PI. Uh, and there's also some online training activities using the NIHR Learn platform. And at the end of this, the uh, associate PI gets formal certification. And this is something that will be quite widely recognized, including by the Royal College of Surgeons uh, and uh, all the other colleges. And it's important to add that there is an additional study running alongside the Starfish trial. And this is a qualitative uh, sub-study. And the reason this has been included is that many patients don't present uh, at all to ENT with sudden hearing loss or to healthcare in general, or that they present late or they're not appropriately referred from primary care. And during the development of the Starfish trial, there were um, a lot of uh, patients who felt that this was a very important issue that should be explored uh, during the trial. So the qualitative sub-study will be remote to local sites. It won't be um, requiring any input from uh, PIs, but it is included on the consent form. So it's important that PIs do have a little bit of an understanding about the trial uh, or the sub-study itself. And what we'll be doing is sampling starfish recruits at six weeks, uh, and just 12 people will be invited uh, over a, a relatively diverse uh, demographic uh, to semi-structured semi focus groups. And the aim of these groups is to try and identify barriers and facilitators to seeking and obtaining help for idiopathic sudden sensory neural hearing loss. So addressing all the issues that currently uh, limit patient access to care, as well as then looking at the treatment we give patients in the main starfish trial. Just as for any research activity, a participant is of course free to withdraw from any or all of the elements of the study at any time, and they don't need to give a reason for doing so. At each of the trial assessments, you should confirm the participant is happy to continue and document this in their medical notes. This can just be a simple reminder that they're in the Starfish trial and they're happy to carry on. But if a participant does want to drop out of the trial or if the participant exits the trial for any other reason, such as if there's a death or a complete loss of contact, please complete a trial exit or change of status form on the online system. Also make a record in their medical notes. Remember that a withdrawal is a patient led decision to stop participating in some or all elements of the study. If it's that a participant has simply missed one or more of the treatments or the assessments, please continue with follow up as far as is possible and just report the assessment or treatment as missed on the relevant form. Any data that's collected will be valuable and will contribute to answering the research question. If you're ever unsure about how to handle a withdrawal, um, please just get in touch with the trial office. CRF should be completed via the online system. Access to this will be provided by the trial team at BCTU on the basis of the delegation log. The patient completed questionnaires are the only paper forms we will use in the trial. We will provide prepaid envelopes for you to return these to the trial office at BCTU, but otherwise everything is electronic. Never share your login to the online system as any changes made are attributed to the user that's logged in. 
we've de designed the system to be as helpful and as user friendly as possible, but please do get in touch with the trial team if we can be of any help. Just as for any clinical trial, it's ultimately the PI's responsibility to ensure that reported data are accurate and we'll ask the PI to sign off the provided data via the online system. The trial office will be reviewing the incoming data throughout the trial for quality and completeness and the independent data monitoring committee will meet regularly to review any safety or methodological issues on the trial so please do return the data in a timely fashion to allow us to do that. For starfish we know the treatments used are well established and so the clinical risks are in line with standard care. For adverse event reporting in starfish, we're using the standard definition for a serious event, which is that any adverse event that results in death that is life threatening, requires hospitalisation or prolongs an existing hospitalisation. If it results in a persistent or significant disability or incapacity, consists of a congenital abnormality or birth defect or is considered otherwise medically significant by the investigator, they will be considered a serious adverse event. AE reporting for non-serious adverse events is limited to the selected relevant events which are captured on the CRFs. The reporting period for any serious adverse events is six weeks from the start of treatment. If a participant experiences a serious AE in that period, please report it to the trials unit in line with the protocol guidance. If the event is listed in the expected SAEs, listed in the protocol, you can report this in line with the normal timeframes for CRF return, which is within four weeks. But any other serious AEs must be reported immediately and within 24 hours of you becoming aware of the event, even if you don't have the full details at that point in time. Remember that adverse events and serious adverse events don't need to have anything to do with the trial treatment. If there's a suspected causal relationship with the trial treatment, they'll be considered adverse reactions. For this trial, planned hospitalisations or hospitalisations that last less than 24 hours are exempt from reporting. Since Starfish is a relatively low risk trial, we're planning for most monitoring to be remote um, via central review and management at BCTU. We will be checking incoming data and site performance. It is possible that monitoring visits might be triggered if there's any cause for concern or if we want to check that things are progressing as planned. So for example, if there's low data return from a site or repeatedly late data return, or if there's an excessive number of withdrawals or protocol deviations, we might arrange a, a visit. As for any clinical trial, it's important for detailed records of the trial conduct and patient treatment on the trial to be maintained. Your investigator site file is the formal record of the trial conduct at your site. You should always keep it up to date and have it ready and accessible in case of an audit or inspection. If you are notified that your site is selected for a regulatory inspection by MHRA, please let us know. After the trial ends, you'll need to retain the trial records for the regulatory archive period. The trials team at BCTU will confirm when you are able to archive or to destroy trial documents. Also remember that there should be clear documented evidence of PI oversight and involvement through the trial. We'll always look to support you through the trial in whatever way we can, but it is possible that we might suspend the trial at any site that has persistent or serious issues. In clinical trials, a serious breach is a breach that's likely to affect to a significant degree, the safety or physical or mental integrity of the participants or the scientific value of the trial. If at any point you become aware of any protocol deviations or anything that might constitute a serious breach, please report it to the trial office as soon as you become aware. If an event is confirmed as a serious breach, we're obliged to report it to the regulatory authority within seven days of becoming aware of it. So it's important to act quickly and provide as much detail as you can. Remember to document having completed this training via the trial's e-training system, which can be accessed via the trial website. You can use the system to self-certify your study training, including for conducting the AB words tests and for the intratympanic injections, if those are relevant for your role. The system will provide a certificate, which you should file in your site file as evidence of training. We at the Clinical Trials Unit will receive a copy automatically too, so you don't need to forward these on to us. 
In addition to the video training, you'll also need to attend one of the live Q&A sessions, which will be scheduled regularly. We recommend that you attend this with the rest of your site team, if that's possible, so that you have a chance to discuss any practical or local issues. We're looking forward to working with you on this important trial. Uh, the contact details for the trials office at BCTU and links to the trial websites and social media accounts are shown on screen uh, over the next couple of slides. Please do get in touch if we can be of any help.